Good morning and welcome to Matthew's United Methodist Church on this beautiful third Sunday in Advent morning. We're so grateful that you've joined us here online for worship, and we're especially grateful for those who are here with us perhaps for the first time. And just to let you know, if you are a first-time guest to our worship service, we invite you to go to our website and to find there the guest connection form. If you'll fill that out, then the church will, in your name and on your behalf, make a $5 contribution to one of our Christmas Eve local partners. We also hope that you will get to know the church by subscribing to our Friday celebration news. That's where we list every week our most comprehensive listing of our events and all of our announcements. All of those things can be found under the Connect tab at matthewsumc.org. We hope that you won't miss anything with regard to these worship services, so you can be sure not to miss out if you'll subscribe to youtube.com slash MatthewsUMC, and you can set your notifications there so that you can begin just before 9.30 and 11 o'clock for our worship services. And then while you're there, you can share in the comments section. You can also view it on demand and on Facebook. So if you haven't already checked in this morning, if you would do that now from either the Sunday morning email or from our website, and share the names, if you would, of those who are there worshiping with you. And remember that you can always go onto the comment section or into the live chat section to let us know that you're watching and to let us know who's there with you. Well, because it is the third Sunday in the season of Advent, the time of preparation leading up to Christmas Eve and to Christmas Day and the birth of Jesus, our Advent series during these weeks has been built around the theme of the many moods of Christmas. So in these worship services, we're trying to shape the scenes of Christmas according to Scripture based on human feelings and emotions. So today's message from Pastor Chuck is titled Christmas Laughter, and it comes from Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. If you want to follow along and read that story, maybe even read the larger story in completion with your family and friends, we're focusing today on the character of Joseph, especially as he learns that his young fiancée, Mary, is pregnant, and he knows that he is not the father. So if you have a candle ready to light for worship, let me invite you to do that now as we enter in now to our time of worship. And now on this Sunday morning, the third Sunday morning in Advent, let me invite you to give your attention to Becky Yates as she lights for us now our Advent candles on our Advent wreath. 
Hear now a scripture from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 through 6. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The third candle on the Advent wreath is called the shepherd's or joy candle. It remembers the first in a long line of people who joyfully shared the good news of the Savior's birth. The candle is a different color reminding us that our period of waiting is half over. Becky will light three candles today, hope, peace, and the pink candle of joy. So would you join us now from wherever you are as we lift up our voices together and sing our opening hymn. It's hymn number 220, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Each and every week as we gather here and gather online with you, we want to always remember that we are forgiven and reconciled people, especially during these days leading up to the birth of Jesus, who is for us not only the great intermediary, but the great reconciler of all of our sins so that we are put back in right relationship with God the Father. And so let me invite you to be a part of that today through not only our time here, but also 
maybe in the days of the coming week to write a note, to pick up a phone, make a phone call, send an email, connect in some way to those who are among your family or friends, maybe uh, fellowship friends from around the church or in your neighborhood. Let them know that they are cared about and thought about during these times of worship and in these very difficult days in which we find ourselves. So friends, let me wish for you now this most ancient greeting of the Christian church. May the peace of Christ be with you. Merry Christmas, Matthews United Methodist Church. May the peace of Christ be with you. Merry Christmas, and may the peace of Christ be with you. 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 And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Team at Matthew's Church. May the, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Merry Christmas. As we prepare now our hearts to go before God in prayer on this Sunday morning, let me lift up now some prayer concerns from within our church community and beyond so that you will know of them and can lift up their names and their situations before God, not only today, but also in your time with God this coming week. So we'd ask that you remember in prayer Brenda Brigman, who is in the hospital, Doug Robinson and Clayton Jones as they recover at home, that we send our sympathy and our grief to Pat Bowes and his family upon the death of his mother. We celebrate and rejoice with the families who have had children in these last number of days in the community. We rejoice with the birth of Elijah Eli Scott Mangum to parents Abby and Greg Mangum, to Dawson Elliott Mooney and parents Morgan and CJ Mooney, which means we have grandparents, very proud grandparents, Jeff and Ann Ennis. We celebrate the birth also of Eleanor Jean Cannington. Her parents are Meredith and Grant Cannington and grandparents would be Clayton and Patty Jones. Friends, this week, our Global Impact Ministry team asked us to be in prayer for Pastor John and for his family and for the staff at the Kidron Valley Orphanage in Uganda. It's also our practice each and every week when we go to God in prayer to lift up a sister community of faith within the area. And so today, we'll be offering prayers for Threshold Church. Would you join me now as we go to God in this time of prayer? Well, God, lift up now into your presence each and every person within the sound of my voice. Let us feel you near as we come to you in prayer. We ask that you would calm our hearts, open our minds, make us ready to receive what you have to give us this day in sermon and in song and in silence. What we seek most today is courage and hope in a world filled with trouble. To capture our hearts with your grace and drive out the fear well, it's fear that often makes us compromise our values and draw back from challenges. Give us confidence in your loving care for us so that we will live boldly and serve freely as we grow in discipleship. We thank you this day for the many answers to prayer we have already received, for the chance to celebrate with others who've achieved a goal, maybe gotten a new job, begun a new relationship. We thank you for the faithfulness of Joseph, for the ways that we experience that same kind of faithfulness from you, and also when we are fortunate from our family and our closest friends when we are struggling. We thank you for those who extend themselves to help others, who offer friendship, who speak words of wisdom and comfort to those whom they encounter. We pray that you would hear our prayers today for those who need healing of body and of spirit. Bind up the broken hearts and free our minds and bodies from disease. Bring peace to those who are nearing the end of life and patience to those who are learning to live with chronic illness. During this season, help us as we rethink Christmas in ways that will honor the birth of your son by giving gifts of great value that may not reflect great cost or big price tags. Now, Lord, in this moment, we fall silent before you, asking you to hear those prayers that are too deep for words.
Now guide us and protect us. Care for and direct us both now and forever as we pray in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we seek to forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in these days to depend upon your financial contributions for the church and ministry to the local community and beyond it, out to our missionaries and those who are representing us in the field, both in our country and beyond us, out into the world. To remind you that you can give online through our Realm platform, or you can simply mail a check in to the church's address. And to remind you also that we are during these weeks of Advent going ahead and allowing people to make contributions in advance for our Christmas Eve offering. If you select Christmas Eve offering under the fund type online, you can contribute to Matthew's Help Center, to Change Choices, and to Esther International. Those are all part of our Christmas Eve offering families. And as you give your attention now to the music, it's provided this week by our music ministry and our musicians in the orchestra and brass group, each of whom either audio taped or videotaped separately all their contributions. And through the help of, of our technician, Joel Mullis, have brought them all together so that you can enjoy what it sounds like when all those separate voices and instruments are joined in one harmonious melody offered to God and to the praise and glory of his son, Jesus. Hear now this great offering of music.
Let us give thanks now as we offer prayer for all the gifts that have been received and those that are making their way here. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we come now lifting these gifts to you in the spirit of joy and obedience that we feel from you as a parent loves a child and only the special way a parent loves a child. And in these times as we wait and prepare for the coming of your son, our Christ, we realize that things don't often come in the way or in the timing that we would like. But we know in this case, in the timing of Advent, in your timing, Jesus will come into our lives and into our hearts, even though we may not be ready, even our though we may not think Our closing hymn for today is hymn number Jesus 240. Join with us now as we share our voices grateful. together and so lift up the words these of now heart, our gifts the, the herald of your kingdom, kingdom that your light and your word might go forth from this place out into all the world. In the name of Father, of Son, and of Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's scripture reading is going to come from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. It's going to be from the New Revised Standard Version. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child con conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through, our, through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son and, the, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like if Adam had never taken a bite of that forbidden fruit? Now, I've always been drawn to the writings of C.S. Lewis, and Lewis once wrote a science fiction fantasy called Paralandra. And in the book, Lewis envisioned a planet where Adam never took that bite. On Paralandra, paradise is unspoiled, and its inhabitants exist in the pristine state that God intended from the very beginning. But one of the unique things about Paralandra is thunder. Now, in our world, thunder is frightening. It sounds like anger in the heavens, but on Paralandra, Thunder is the sound of God laughing. Now, do you think God laughs? Does God have a sense of humor? Now, this morning, I would like to try and answer that question with a resounding yes. God has a sense of humor. Now, I'd like to really urge you to laugh every once in a while during my sermon today because it's titled Christmas Laughter, and we do need some laughter these days. Jack Benny, one of the great master comedians, used to warn people about not laughing, and he would say, every time you suppress a laugh, it goes back down in your body and it spreads to your hips. Now, we certainly don't want that, do we? We don't want it to happen to us. 
Throughout the ages, philosophers have debated over what it is that tickles our funny bone and causes that joyous explosion of air out of our lungs and across our vocal cords, which we call laughter. Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, wasn't it wasn't big on laughter. And according to his thinking, that which was laughable was considered to be a subcategory of the ugly. But thinkers who walk in the way of Jesus, for the most part, have tended to look upon laughter as a gift of God. I immediately think of the great writer Dante. You remember his literary classic, The Divine Comedy? And yet among the great thinkers of the world about the only agreement that we can find is that humor is defined by two elements, incongruity and surprise. G.K. Chesterton defined humor as the sudden perception of incongruity. Now friends, that would be when two things we usually keep in separate compartments of our brain suddenly cross paths inside of our head and the result is laughter. For example, I don't know if you heard the great story about the bait shop down along Highway 49 down near Lake Wiley. And one day, a member of today's young adult generation pulled up to that bait shop on his motorcycle. And the young guy, he had tattoos and pierced ears and a pierced nose, pierced eyebrows, pierced tongue. And the old bait shop proprietor had been smoking I imagine unfiltered Camel cigarettes for the last 50 years. So this example of today's youth subculture was completely outside of his experience. So the young guy walked in and asked, got any ball peanuts? And the bait shop owner stared at the young man's face as he stubbed out his cigarette. And then he came out from behind the counter to examine the young man more closely. And finally, still staring at the young man's face, he asked, now boy, tell me, Exactly where were you standing when that tackle box exploded? <laughs> now, tattoos and body piercings, we know them to be two of the hippest trades in today's culture, but they were interpreted by this man as the aftermath of a terrible accident. Now, do you see what I'm talking about? It's incongruity and the surprise that comes you when you perceive an incongruity and it leads to laughter. Maybe you heard about the group of New York archaeologists who found traces of copper wire dating back 100 years and then only dug down about 10 feet and they concluded that their ancestors already had a telephone network more than 100 years ago. Well, not to be outdone by the New Yorkers a few weeks later, a group of California archaeologists, they dug to a depth of about 20 feet, and shortly afterward, a story in the L.A. Times read, California archaeologists finding traces of 200-year-old copper wire, and they have concluded that their ancestors already had an advanced high-tech communications network 100 years earlier than the New Yorkers. Well... One week later, the Charlotte Observer reported the following. After digging as deep as 30 feet in his backyard, Fred Yancey, a self-taught archaeologist, reported that he found absolutely nothing. Fred has therefore concluded that 300 years ago, North Carolina had already gone wireless. Well, humor has to surprise us, and it causes us to consider things in a different light. But let's go back to my original question. Does God have a sense of humor? Well, have you read the Christmas story lately? I mean, what sounded like a terrible accident turned out to be the greatest story ever told. And judging by this story, I believe that God has the greatest sense of humor that the universe has ever known. And our scripture lesson is Joseph. 
His life is marching along in one direction, and then life takes a very different turn, and Joseph doesn't think it is one bit funny. Joseph is a carpenter. I envision him as a kind of punch-the-time-clock sort of guy who'd come home at night and pet the dog, read the paper, retire early to bed, and then he would rise at daybreak to get out to the job site. Now, we know that Joseph didn't talk much. In fact, even though 15 cities in the United States are named after Joseph, there's no record of a single word from his mouth in all of the Bible. Some of you may know what it's like to be married to a man like that, that proverbial, strong, silent type. Joseph was quiet and practical, liked working with wood, material you could measure and cut and work with your hands. Joseph loved Mary for she was honest, simple, a down-home young girl the kind you could settle down with and raise a family. Mary and Joseph, they thought they had it all. They had love, they had trust, they had dreams, and the date had been set and the china was registered and the invitations were in the mail. And then one day, Mary said, Joseph, I need to tell you something. I'm going to have a baby and suddenly Joseph's simple, perfect life dissolves into a world of pain. And Mary continued saying, now Joseph, there's nothing to worry about because you see there was this angel. Now you can imagine Joseph's response. Yeah, sure, an angel. I mean, did it prove to be too much to ask of this young man? Now, according to their tradition, when Mo Mary started to show, Joseph had no choice but to put her away, to distance himself from her. Jewish culture and their religious understanding, it just demanded it. But one night, before he did so, an angel appeared to Joseph and said, verse 20, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child within her is from God. This is Emmanuel, the long-awaited fulfillment of the prophecy, God with us. Now, although our scripture lesson doesn't say so, I believe Joseph's first reaction to this announcement was, now wait a minute, angel. I didn't sign up for this. All I want is is to be a carpenter, to have a wife and a house and a, and a yard and a family. And as he's thinking these things, you can imagine laughter in the heavens, thunder from Paralandra, if you will. How about you this morning? Any of you listening to my voice this morning have have you ever experienced one of God's surprises? Now, if you ask the Wilson family, Karen, we, I, we, we would tell you we've we got two gifts in Texas, another one born right here in Matthews, and then, oh yes, there is our Mackenzie, our little surprise, the caboose at the end of the family. That was the kind of surprise that God had in store for a, a white-haired woman by the name of Sarah. Do you remember her in the Old Testament? Sarah was so old she had to squint to focus on the baby in her arms who wasn't her grandson but was her very son. And her husband Abraham, he was 100 years old. And Genesis tells us that when Abraham heard he was going to be the father at such an advanced age that he fell on the ground laughing. Someone once said to me that he was laughing just to keep from crying. At another point in this story of Abraham and Sarah, Sarah is doing some eavesdropping from behind the flap of the tent when she heard God's news that she would bear a son. And so she giggled until tears streamed down her cheeks. But God got the last laugh. 
He told Abraham and Sarah that the child would be a boy and he would be named Isaac. You remember what Isaac means in that original Hebrew? It means laughter. Anybody hearing laughter from heaven this morning? I mean, we find some of our best laid plans getting derailed and then God giving us the last thing we ever expected. You know, I find that couples that are about to be married are, are people who are deeply invested in their plans. Uh, my experience through the years has been that most times, a lot of times, that they're simply unwilling to allow any detail to fall out of their control. Now, you can't imagine some of the brides that I've encountered in my day with their lists and their notebooks and their diagrams. But can't you just hear God laughing? <laughs> Sure, go ahead and plan your wedding to the smallest detail, but just try to plan your marriage that way. I mean, we human beings, we, we try so hard to create tidy little worlds where we're in complete control. And just when we think we've got it ma managed to do so, that laughter from heaven, why it just sounds again. And if you ever see that wonderful movie from a few years ago, it was titled Remains of the Day by, and it was starring Anthony Hopkins. Now in the film, Hopkins portrays Stevens, who's the head butler of the palatial Darlington Hall in Oxfordshire, England. And as a butler, Mr. Stevens is compulsive, and meticulous and a stickler for details. Before dinner, he takes a ruler and he goes down the table, measuring the distance between the edge of the table and the water glass that is at each place setting. And he says things like, forgive me for being personal, but may I wish you a pleasant holiday? I mean, his whole life is defined by being a butler, even to the point that one night uh, when a dinner party is being held at the estate, he's told by the maid that his father, who had been ill, has just died upstairs. And Stevens replies, I am indeed sorry, but matters of the utmost importance are happening under this roof tonight. So instead of attending his father on his deathbed, Stevens continues his work. Now for me, the drama of the story occurs when a wonderful woman on his staff, the head housekeeper, falls in love with him. And Stevens is terrified because love, why that's going to complicate his tidy world. And so he cowers behind all of that armor of his dignity and he tells her of his deep respect for her professionalism, but he says nothing of any personal feelings that he has for her as a woman. Well, finally, late in life, Stevens has one last chance to go to her now, friends, I don't want to ruin the film for you by telling you what happens, but there is this particularly symbolic scene that I want to try to describe. Somehow, a white pigeon gets into one of the sitting rooms at Darlington, and Stevens is just beside himself. And he runs around, and he chases the intruder, and finally he opens a window, and he throws out the dove. And at that point, in what I think is brilliant movie making, the camera angle shifts and we're now seeing from the perspective of the dove who flies up and up and up and soon we realize that this is not a bird's eye view. What we're seeing is through the eyes of God. And we look down and we see Stevens and it seems as if we see him behind bars that obscure him from our view and they trap him like an inmate in his castle. Dear friends, the love of God that is found in Jesus invades our tidy worlds like a wild bird flying into our picture-perfect sitting room. God doesn't come to us as a 
decorative figurine that we can place on the mantle. God comes to our lives as the, the great interrupter, the great disruptor of some of our best laid plans, the great chip and de cure. That's one of the names that I learned a couple of years back that our African friends in Zanzibar that they have for God, the chip and de cure. You know what it means? It means the one who turns things upside down. Friends, that's what this season does to us, doesn't it? And especially this year. It just turns everything upside down. It's the great inversion. God coming to earth in the form of a human being, being the, the ruler of the cosmos, trapped in a, in, in a squalling package of helpless flesh. This inversion, why it just flips all of our expectations. It, it flips our systems of power. And friends, it flips all our narratives in our head. Right now, for some of you, you might be thinking that if your world has been turned upside down already, none of this sounds very joyful. But this inversion, this chip and de cure, it comes with expectant hope. That when the world is out of sorts, that Jesus comes to be God with us. Remember a few short weeks ago, all the major media outlets were full with the announcement of the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize winners. You know how the Nobel Peace Prize came to be? It was established because of a huge unexpected surprise in the life of Alfred Nobel. Nobel had been a phenomenally successful businessman, and his business was the manufacture and the sale of weapons. He'd spent a lifetime amassing a fortune as the inventor of dynamite. And then one morning, Alfred Nobel got up, opened the morning newspaper, and he read his own obituary on the front page. Now, friends, it was a simple journalistic error. His brother had died, and the newspaper printed the wrong biographical information. And the headline read, Dynamite King Dead. And in that moment, Alfred Nobel saw how the world would remember him when he was gone, and he didn't like it at all. So he went to work changing his legacy. And in his will, Alfred Nobel established the most prestigious prize on earth, awarded annually to the person or group who does the most to promote peace in this world, the Nobel Peace Prize. Alfred Nobel's wake-up call was one of God's surprises. And when he heard that wake-up call, Alfred Nobel obeyed. How about you this morning? You ever been surprised by an encounter with Chip and de Cure, the one who turns things upside down? Could that unwelcome surprise that has occurred in your life, could it have been a wake-up call to you? I mean, do you think that obeying God's voice like Alfred Nobel did, perhaps you could bring more peace and less dynamite here on earth, more goodwill and blessing and hope among all people? In verse 24 of our scripture lesson for today, we read what I think is the key about Joseph. In fact, I, I think it's the key to his life. It reads, Joseph did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. Joseph took that pregnant young woman as his bride. And soon thereafter, he was forced to flee for his life 
to a foreign country where he spent the next couple of years trying to learn Egyptian. We really don't know if he ever got the house of his dreams, you know, with the white picket fence and the nice yard. So was letting himself be surprised by God and obeying God's voice, was it worth it? Oh, my gracious. Think of the joy in Joseph's life. He got to watch Jesus take his first baby steps. He got to watch that, that heavenly toddler grow up. He taught the boy his love of simple, honest work. Jesus grew up to be known as the carpenter. But nothing, nothing could have been a clear expression of the special bond Joseph had with Jesus than the fact that when that boy became a preacher, the messenger of God. Why, he went out and he taught the entire world to call God the very word he himself had called Joseph, the Hebrew word Abba, which translates to English, Daddy. So the next time a monkey wrench drops into your well-oiled machinery, don't curse God. In fact, you might even take a moment to see that unwelcome surprise as maybe an opportunity to trust or maybe a gift to receive or perhaps even a chance to obey because in the end, life gives us nothing we ever expected. But God gives us everything we ever dreamed of. You just ask Joseph. Let us pray. Gracious God, we admit that we are a people, we just don't like surprises. And we work so hard to engineer all of those surprises just completely out of our lives. And we want our lives and we want our schedules. We want it all to run like clockwork. And then we hear your laughter from heaven. Help us to receive those surprises as, as just that, as opportunities to trust. Or maybe as that opportunity to respond to your call upon our life, even though, even when it might go against our plans. God, we would ask this day that you would break in to our tidy little worlds and send your dove that we might know your love. Even as Jesus was sent, as you sent Jesus into the life of Joseph. All of these things we offer to you this day, O oh God. Amen. And now, friends, let's continue our worship today with our closing hymn. Let's worship God.
now may the God that revealed himself as a baby born in a manger, may he reveal himself to you this next week in the simplest of acts and the least likely of people. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.